Okay, so breast cancer surgery options, if you'll go on to the next couple of slides, I have no disclosures. So looking at breast surgery options, there is something called breast conservation. Um, that means that we're trying to preserve the breast so that after a lumpectomy or such, that your breast actually looks like your breast and um, that you don't necessarily need to have a mastectomy. Uh, occasionally, you do need to have a mastectomy depending on the disease process and uh, depending on that biology and the location of disease and the size of tumor, you can consider doing nipple sparing, mastectomy, skin sparing, mastectomy, or total mastectomy. As part of the uh, breast conservation, an option is something called oncoplastic reduction. So if you happen to have a relatively large breast and a relatively small size tumor, but you had considered maybe reducing the breast volume, um, plastic surgeons can work with us to make sure that the appropriate cancer surgery is performed. And then the plastic surgeon will perform the reduction uh, to provide better cosmesis and uh, sometimes uh, for very large-breasted ladies, uh, it provides a more convenient and more comfortable treatment with the subsequent radiation therapy. Uh, there are multiple ways of doing the axillary management, and one of them is doing the sentinel lymph node procedure, where we use a special dye to guide us in removing a targeted set of lymph nodes rather than um, the so-called back-in-the-old-days axillary dissection of removing all the nodes that we uh, find in the axilla. There's something called de-escalation that you may or may not hear about. Um, what we are using um, is the biology of the disease to determine the options that are available for treatment so that we give you the best oncologic or the cancer treatment option, but at the same time not have to do all the standard textbook uh, work um, because we wanna also look at the next item, which is quality of life. Uh, next slide, please. Some of the more common uh, breast cancers that we discuss are invasive ductal carcinomas, invasive lobular carcinomas, and then the ductal carcinoma in situ, which are non-invasive cancers. But we do treat them similarly with surgeries and uh, radiation therapy. Uh, next slide, please. So the next two slides are actually quite busy and it's just statistics and this is a very, very old, well, okay, it's an old study, but it's very good solid study that looked at uh, comparing women having uh, mastectomy versus lumpectomy versus lumpectomy and radiation therapy. And um, in the end, it turns out that there was really no difference in survival, meaning there was no difference stage for stage in how long you lived um, as long as the appropriate surgery was done. So this leads us to thinking that if we can do lumpectomy, we can do lumpectomy and provide you with uh, optimal cancer treatment without having to lose the breast. I think that provides for a better quality of life down the road. Next slide, please. Mm, okay. Um, so the next slide just looks at overall survival numbers, which are uh, no statistically different. I'm, my screen's not moving. I don't know if other people, okay. Um, thank you. So this now talks about what do we do? The best approach now is to utilize something called multidisciplinary tumor board. Anytime a, a lady is diagnosed with breast cancer at our facility, our, the patients are presented. Uh, uh, to a, a group of uh, specialists, uh, medical oncologists who specialize in breast cancer management, radiation oncologists, surgeons, Dr. Elzebedi and myself um, uh, participate in the uh, tumor conferences at Del Norte and Central DuPage Hospital. We also have additional members that play key roles, genetic counselors, social workers, breast navigators, and various other folks um, come in to uh, discuss that particular case and decide based on national guidelines um, and the biology of disease, how best to offer treatment. So we look at patient's health and function, we evaluate quality of life, so we look at older patients and for younger patients, we look at the biology of the tumor and determine what kind of impact the treatment has on the patient and how best to target the treatment. We use tumor biology. So not everybody needs to get chemotherapy. Some people do need chemotherapy and some people need immunotherapy. We are fine tuning in order to tailor our treatment for our patients. 
And with those pieces of data in, in mind, we can then learn what type of surgery is also going to bring the best outcome for our patients. Next slide, please. As I mentioned about the uh, generous breast volume, so if we are able to provide lumpectomy with combined plastic type oncoplastic surgery, the patient ends up with a smaller and more lighter and maybe more symmetrical breast after having the cancer operation, allows for the radiation oncologist to target the breast uh, without having to worry about positioning. Um, and then of course, uh, the, uh, another option is mastectomy with reconstruction. We work with our plastic surgeon to make sure that we are offering the correct type of reconstruction and correct timing for our patients. Now, patients who have a large tumor, but in a relatively smaller breast, uh, where a lumpectomy may be quite disfiguring, and you can't do reduction because you already have small breast volume, in those situations, you may have to consider a mastectomy as your option. And then the closure becomes uh, more option now. There's flat closure opportunities. There's immediate reconstruction opportunities. There's delayed reconstruction opportunities. All of those things are discussed in a multidisciplinary fashion uh, with the patient, the plastic surgeon, and the other treating physicians to make sure we are offering it in a proper timeline. Um, Additionally, I did not mention here in this slide is that for larger tumors, sometimes we may give chemotherapy before surgery to try to shrink the tumor so that we can offer a lumpectomy as an option. Additionally, the consideration of radiation therapy. So some ladies and their significant others feel that if you get a mastectomy that you're done. You're done and done, and it's not always true. Some cancers will require, even after breast removal, that you will need to have chemotherapy. Some breast cancers, even after breast removal, you may need to have radiation. So we have to take those situations into consideration before deciding and jumping on one particular type of surgery. So again, the multidisciplinary decision is quite important in the decision-making process. Okay, next slide. Lymph node assessment. So sentinel node procedure you may have heard about that is utilizing radioactive dye or a blue color dye or a combination in order to identify the lymph node that will harbor information for us so that we can tailor your treatment. This is usually applied to ladies who have, or gentlemen who may have breast cancer, um, in situations where the lymph node is what we call clinically negative. So it is not a suspicious mass. There's nothing by ultrasound or mammogram that shows um, changes um, that are suspicious for metastatic disease. So clinically node negative uh, cancers, we can utilize the sentinel node procedure. That helps to decrease the scar, potential scar formation because we are targeting and narrowing down the actual um, dissection or maneuvering inside the axilla in hopes that we could decrease the risk of lymphedema. Choosing wisely campaign is something that has been uh, utilized in all types of cancer management and, and in fact in many types of other um, health issues as well. Um, but for uh, surgical oncology and breast surgery, we are now looking at what is the benefit of doing certain lymph node procedures in a certain age group. So specifically in an older population with very early stage type cancer, if we are not going to change our suck our therapy options, then is it really um, important to operate, to on, operate the on the area, uh, taking the risk of the potential complications when that answer may not actually help at all? So um, we will have to have a discussion and make sure that we are offering uh, a tailored and an appropriate surgical option for our patients. Sometimes, as I mentioned about the neoadjuvant therapy, we can give chemotherapy to shrink tumor. We can also um, give chemotherapy to decrease tumor burden in the lymph node. And the goal is obviously to reduce the tumor burden so that we can offer hopefully less interventional surgery. Again, here comes that multidisciplinary decision making. Um, next slide, please. So my thought is that for breast cancer management, we need to have a team of medical and surgical specialists that work with you in order to help the uh, uh, help you obtain the best cancer and quality of life outcome. 
So that is my portion on the surgery. I know it's very brief and it's not very specific, but I just wanted to draw some attention. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ron. Um, that our, thank you very much. Our next speaker, and we'll just keep this rolling, um, is Dr. El Zubedi, and she is also a surgeon at Northwestern Medicine. So Dr. El Zubedi, when you're ready. Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Sue, can you hear me? Everyone can hear me? Yes. Yes. Wonderful. Okay. So my topic here, I move a little bit away from the surgical intervention and I focus on a precision medicine. And this is basically a strategy that really gained attention in the early 2000s to 2015, where it focuses on the genetic variability within the patient with the specific tumor or disease, not just a tumor only, and then follow and see how the genes variability, the environment of the patient and the lifestyle influence the disease progression and then the treatment for that. That led actually to a big initiative, the Precision Medicine Initiative, that passed in 2015 with significant uh, donations uh, given to research on um, breast cancers and cancers in general. So we can move on to the next slide, please, Sue. No financial disclosures. Next slide. I'll be focusing here on the different subtypes within breast cancers and see how can genomics and proteomics influence the behavior of breast cancers, what are some of the tests that we utilize as a predictive prognostic, and also how can we utilize for the treatment of breast cancers, and what are some of the targeted therapies here, systemic therapies I'll be talking about that we can use in the neoadjuvant as well as in the adjuvant setting. Next slide. Historically, we thought of cancers, not just to breast cancers, but all kind of cancers as one specific disease that originate from one subtype of tissue. For example, the breast originated from breast tissue and behaved in a certain predictive pattern and the treatment of this cancer follows a, a paradigm that I've established. However, genomics in the past 20 years, especially um, in DNA molecular biology, and the many financial competitions have led to a decrease in the cost of tests that allows us to bank tumors, analyze their genotypes, and then potentially find common themes within specific subtypes that then can be targeted with the specific therapies with a greater outcome and better prognosis, as well as minimizing toxicities of, uh, of the treatment. Next slide. Historically, breast cancer was really thought of as extrinsic uh, biomarkers, whether it's estrogen positive, progesterone positive, and we checked for those biomarkers on the cell surface. But uh, advances in molecular biology have allowed us actually to sequence DNA tumors and identify certain themes within them and classify them based on the intrinsic rather than the extrinsic um, division. Uh, and most commonly, we have four different subtypes now, the luminal A, luminal B. These are tumors that are highly, highly enriched with the estrogen and the progesterone. They have less proliferative and uh, less proliferative, excuse me, genes, have better uh, behavior, uh, better prognosis. Treatment usually, not always, but usually does not involve chemotherapy. And we compare them with the tumors that are, for example, triple negative. They lack the estrogen, they lack the progesterone, the HER2 receptors. These are tumors, although a large class of multiple subtypes within the triple negatives, we do know they tend to have higher uh, correlations of proliferating genes. These tumors tend to have slightly more aggressive features. And if left untreated well, potentially well, may have worse prognosis. Therefore, their treatment is much more um, involved and may involve chemotherapy. Key features I keep repeating here are proliferating genes. It's the genomes that kind of dictate the behavior of the disease, and therefore treatment should be also specifically taken into account these proliferation genes. Next slide. 
again, the prognosis of the different types of breast cancers. So this is a graph, it's pretty generic. It looks at stage two, stage three, and stage four, and it classifies the prognosis of these cancers based on the molecular subtypes, the four one I listed. Um, you see the blue one, that's the estrogen positive HER2 negative. So that's a, your classic luminal A type. It carries a favorable prognosis in a stage two, three, and even four, although interesting in stage four, we see the HER2 positive tumors with the estrogen positive as having much better prognosis. And you see the black line, the black curve in all the stages, that's the triple negative, carries uh, a worse prognosis again in all stages. So that tells us it's those intrinsic subtyping of breast cancers, reflecting different genes, expressing different behaviors, have a predictive and a prognostic implications. And therefore, treatment should also be tailored toward those genomic changes. Next slide. Uh, here, this is interesting, and I, I borrowed this picture from CBIO uh, portal. This is where we are allowed to bank tumors analyze them, their DNA sequencing, and identify certain alterations within the genes, and then look at different subtypes and see which alterations are, are more commonly to be seen. In pie graph A and B, you see these are luminal A and the luminal B, we see high concentration of an alteration within the, a gene called the pica 3 ca This is a very common alterated genes in a breast cancer. It's common to even the triple negative, but much higher concentration in the luminal A and B. Those are the estrogen positive, progesterone possibly positive HER2 negative. It tells us that this potential gene alteration can be targeted by a therapy of the pica 3 ca And we have a new drugs that are just being introduced targeting the pica 3 ca in estrogen positive tumors, in particular in the metastatic setting. On the other hand, the pi graph D, we see more of that red uh, portion of the graph, much more higher concentration. This is the TP53. Approximately one fifth of patients with the triple negative have an alteration in this genome. And so this genome can potentially serve as a target. We are not there yet, but this can be a target of a drug that can influence the behavior of the triple negative and potentially has an implication to change the prognosis. Next slide. So what are some of these uh, genomic analyses, assays that we can use and what do we use them for? So first, we look at multiple genes on the tumor. Thank you. Multiple genes in the tumor, ident especially the proliferation genes. Second, we can determine the behavior of the tumor based on these genes if they are present. And then third, they can allow us to design a treatment plan that will more likely influence the uh, prognosis of the patient. The most common three multi-gene assays we use are the Oncotype DX, the Mammoprint, and the PAM50 or ProSigma. And in all these three, the most common genes they look at are the proliferation genes. How fast are these tumor cells growing? How are, likely are they to be invasive? And what is uh, the predicted behavior of the gene? So they are predictive and prognostic. But more importantly for us, other than just giving us interesting information, is actually they can help us tell um, which patients likely to benefit from systemic chemotherapy and which ones are not likely to benefit. And therefore, if we give chemotherapy, we're more likely to deal with the toxicities without the expected benefit. Next slide. So this is the most common test we have at Northwestern campuses is the Oncotype DX. And the validity and the utility of this test has been well established. It looked at proliferation genes and invasion genes, and those are nine out of the 16 genes it look at. And it scores the patient, gives us a mathematical number that we can follow and tells us, kind of guide us what to do, who is likely to receive a benefit from chemotherapy and who is likely not to. So if we go on the next slide, these are two major uh, trials that proved the validity and the utility of this test. Patients who scored low or who got a score below 11 or so did not benefit from chemotherapy, as you see on the left graph. 
um, the orange and the gray lines are superimposed on each other. So these patients likely to get the toxicities of chemo if they receive it without the benefit. On the other hand, the group that received a score higher than 25, these patients likely to benefit from chemotherapy because without chemotherapy, their metastatic recurrence is significantly higher as you see with that gray curve. The orange curve is the group that received chemotherapy. Now, what about the group in the middle, somewhere between 11 and 25? That's another trial that followed over 10,000 patients. That's the Taylor X trial, and that's the one on the right, the graph on the right. And again, what we found after a follow-up of these patients, no benefit for chemotherapy in the patients who received intermediate score. So patients who benefited from chemotherapy in estrogen positive tumor using the multi-gene assay, the Oncotype DX, were the group that received a score 25 and higher. Their metastatic potential over a 10-year period reduced significantly. Next slide. What about the targeted therapy? So we're now moving a little bit um, to the treatment. Here in particular, I'm going to just give a few examples of the triple negative, the HER2 positive, and BRCA-associated breast cancer. Next slide. One of the hottest topics right now in oncology is the role of the immunotherapy. What is the role of the immune system in fighting cancers, and can we use immunotherapy to kill cancer cells once they develop? The orange circular, the dark orange circle here, this is, let's say, a tumor cell. And a tumor cell may express a small piece of the tumor, that yellow piece on its surface. A circulating immune cell, a T cell in the tissue around, will come and see this yellow and says, this is not supposed to be there, and therefore I am going to be activated and kill cell. As you can imagine, there are inhibitory molecules. The body keeps everything in check, and it has uh, it recognizes itself, and so it has a break system on the immune system to prevent collateral damage to nearby cell. And one of those inhibitory molecules is the PDL1. PDL1, think of it as a turn off or a break system to the immune cells. And so once the, our T cell sees the tumor cells but recognize the PDL1, says, Well, this is self, I should not kill it, I will leave it alone. So we take advantage of that in uh, uh, molecular um, genetics, it's specifically cancer molecular genetics. We have developed drugs that inhibit this PDL1. And by inhibiting this PDL1, now our T cell will then act be activated and start engaging in the killing of cells. So for this tumor to be effective, for this treatment to be effective, we need breast cancers that are enriched with T cells. We need T cells in the tissue. But second, we also would like to see some PDL1 present so we can take advantage of this mechanism. Next slide. So here, as I said, triple negatives, approximately three fourths of the triple negatives have really enriched T lymphocytes present. So they are ideal for this particular type of treatment. And also about half of them express PDL1. Again, triple negatives right now is the ideal candidate for immunotherapy in breast cancer. Next slide. Two major trials that have led to approval of immunotherapy recently in breast cancer in 2020 and actually July of this year was the keynote trials, the 522 and 176. Um, in pembrolizumab, I listed here keynote 522, the use of pembrolizumab with chemotherapy prior to surgery compared with chemotherapy alone followed by surgery. And what we found, the use of the immunotherapy have reduced, have eradicated breast cancer in approximately 65% of patients compared with 51%. Second, the event-free survival was significantly higher. Event-free survival means it took longer for these patients to develop any recurrence. Again, the immunotherapy group had much higher event-free survival, had much higher complete pathologic response compared with the group that received chemotherapy only. Not surprisingly, the toxicities are higher, and we had one death in this trial as a result of this immunotherapy. Next slide. Complete pathologic response translates into higher uh, survival, and in particular, event-free survival. So the rent 
curves in both graphs, those are the patient who had a complete pathologic response. Their prognosis was significantly better than the groups that did not achieve complete pathologic response. Next slide. In summary for immunotherapy, immunotherapy is now associated with a greater PCR in the patients who have a triple negative of breast cancer and we have approval for at least two medications right now for stage four triple negatives, as well as late advanced non-metastatic triple negatives. Higher PCR has been also translating with a higher event of free survival. Next slide. Very briefly, HER2 enriched the breast cancers tumor that are highly proliferative for the HER2. Uh, this is about 15 to 20% of breast cancers. We have a cascade of events that occur within the cell leading to greater proliferation and more of an invasion. If we can somehow target the HER2 with certain targeted therapies, we have achieved a greater PCR in these patients. And right now, the standard of care in patients who have HER2 positive tumor greater than two centimeter and or positive lymph node is the use of two dual HER2 uh, antagonist monoclonal antibodies, that's the pertuzumab and the trastuzumab, in combination with chemotherapy with excellent uh, PCR, also excellent uh, survival. Next slide, this is coming from the Cleopatra trial, and what we see that the median overall survival, so approximately 50% of patients were alive at 40 months in the, in the patients who received chemotherapy only compared with 56 months, so higher median survival in the group that received dual HER2 treatment with chemotherapy. So this is now the standard of care for patients who have HER2 positive tumors. Next slide. And then finally, I will end on talking uh, particular breast cancers that are related to mutations in the BRCA genes. Uh, and here, just before I talk about this treatment, um, DNA gets replicated multiple times in a cell and it develops breaks within the strands of the DNA. And the body has at least two different mechanisms to repair this break. And one of those mechanisms involves the BRCA gene. A normal BRCA gene turns on a repair mechanism that repair that break. But the second mechanism is the PARP enzyme. That's another enzyme that is important to rescue the DNA when there is a repair. So patients who have a mutated BRCA gene, BRCA protein, that repair mechanism is defective. And if somehow we can take advantage of blocking the second repair mechanism, the PARP enzyme, now we've created a broken, quote unquote, broken DNA, and we are forcing that cell to die, that tumor cell to die. And so the PARP inhibitors is a new class of categories, and we have two drugs that gained FDA approval in 2018 and 2020 that actually inhibit the PARP, both in the metastatic setting of uh, gene protein uh, breast cancers, as well as advanced breast cancers, the olaparib and the tinazolaparib. So the next slide here, very briefly, is the Olympiada trial that looks at Olaparib in the metastatic, uh, metastatic ER positive or negative or two negative of breast cancers associated with a BRCA mutation. And while the median progression survival is very slightly improved by two and a half to three months at the most, what we have shown it we can target another mode of a mutation and we can take advantage of this repair, defective repair mechanism in patients. And the next slide actually is the survival. So next slide. I wanna just call your attention for graph B. The blue line here is the elaborate patients. The green line is the patient who received chemotherapy only. And we see that survival improved. It's higher in the blue line compared with the green line. This is the group of patients who've never received chemotherapy. So elaborate is now considered as part of the first and second line treatment in metastatic breast cancers associated with the BRCA mutations. Next slide. 
in the future. So I'm really looking forward. I'm really excited about um, breast cancer research in the future. In particular, what if we can identify circulating a tumor DNA? What if we can identify circulating a tumor cells as potential um, biomarkers? And we can guide our treatment based on these findings rather than think of a breast cancer as one specific disease or process. The future is really promising and I'm really excited to be part of it. Thank you. Oops. Thank you, Dr. Elzebedi. Um, that was excellent. Um, and our final presenter uh, today is Dr. Kulkarni, and she um, will just welcome Dr. Uh, Kulkarni, and then we'll take questions at the end. And I see that there are quite a few already in the chat, so just keep keep them coming in the chat, and we'll get to them um, right after Dr. Kulkarni is done presenting. Thank you. Um, great. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Swati Kulkarni. I am a breast surgeon from Northwestern uh, Memorial Hospital downtown. Um, today, I wanted to just spend a little bit of time talking about ductal carcinoma in situ. Uh, and so the title of my talk is From Mastectomy to Active Surveillance. Um, it's a promise of personalized treatment for DCIS. And I'm kind of glad that I went last because I think I'm drawing from themes both from Dr. An's talk and Dr. Alzebedi's talk. So uh, we'll go with the first slide. Uh, so this is what I'm going to talk about. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about the definition and current management of DCIS. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about um, de-escalation of care. And then finally, uh, I'm going to give a little plug for um, a clinical trial that I have uh, that is open and ongoing and is actually open uh, actually open at, um, at the main campus and also um, in the West region. Next slide. So I wanted to start off um, first by talking about what ductal carcinoma in situ is. Um, what I found is um, when patients come to the clinic they, they, and, and potentially they, they get this diagnosis, they're not really sure uh, what it is. And um, sometimes there's a lot of anxiety over it. And so I, I thought it would be a good opportunity to kind of introduce this topic and talk about and, and also just uh, just give you a little bit more information about it. So I think just to start with, um, the thing that I want to, you know, first of all, it's something that um, was uh, discovered back in the 19th century before nobody had ever really described uh, ductal carcinoma in situ. And what ductal carcinoma in situ is, which if you translate it, it sounds like cancer cells in the duct, which was first defined in um, 1932. What it is, is it's the, it's the the definition from the um, World Health Organization is it's a neoplastic proliferation of mammary duct epithelial cells that's confined, I think that's key, to the ductal lobular system. So what's, what's important about DCIS and how it really differs from invasive cancer is that the cells are separated and they're really guarded from the surrounding um, fibro fibrous and vascular tissue um, by the basement membrane of the ducts. So it's really enclosed within the ducts. Um, and so that's kind of, I tried to have two pictures down here that shows how DCIS is enclosed within the ducts. And then as in contrast to invasive cancer, which is in the surrounding uh, tissue around the duct. Um, I think the important thing about DCIS, I also like to stress, is that it does not have the ability to metastasize because it's enclosed in the duct. Um, as it relates to invasive breast cancer, what we call, what we say about it is that it is a non-obligate precursor of invasive breast cancer. So that what that means is um, a certain percentage of it um, progresses onto invasive breast cancer, but then a certain percentage does not. So we usually say um, anywhere from 30 to 50 percent um, will progress to invasive breast cancer, and the remaining uh, DCIS uh, either, you know, generally just stays as DCIS. Um, next slide. So um, how common is DCIS? So before the advent of screening mammography, DCIS was really rare. We hardly ever found it unless it presented like a mass, like, like invasive breast cancer. But with the advent of screening mammography, currently 20% of what we call newly diagnosed breast cancers are comprised of DCIS. And uh, in 2019, that was about 50,000 cases. Um, one thing that I also really like to stress about DCIS is that it has 
an excellent prognosis. So um, the most recent statistics show that the, the mortality from DCIS at 20 years is only 3.3%. Next slide. So how do we, you know, we kind of talked about how before screening mammography, we didn't really identify DCIS. So, so the way that we um, identify DCIS with someone who undergoes a mammogram is um, they develop uh, what we call microcalcifications. And I think it's, a, you know, I've tried to label this. They have little small white dots um, on the mammogram, and that's really how um, we identify it, that usually patients have no symptoms uh, when they're diagnosed with DCIS. Um, you know, sometimes patients have other types of imaging. We don't oftentimes see much if a patient has ultrasound. And then another test women might get um, when they have DCIS is they may um, also sometimes get an MRI. Um, and that is because sometimes the calcifications can underestimate uh, the um, the amount of DCIS, um, but sometimes we have to be a little bit careful uh, with MRIs. Sometimes they can find there can be what we call false positives. They can find areas that look suspicious that are not necessarily um, clinically important. So the way we generally um, diagnose the DCIS once we see abnormal calcifications is we do what's called a stereotactic or mammographically guided biopsy. And um, the radiologist will oftentimes place a clip um, to help the surgeon, if, when the patient has surgery, find the area since we generally, um, the patient generally has a normal breast exam. Next slide. Um, there are many different types of DCIS. Um, we generally can classify it based on the histology, and then we can also classify it based on the grade. There are three grades, grade one, two, and three. Next slide. So treatment for DCIS, there's there um, uh, if the, one of the, one of the, the the standard treatment for DCIS for many years up until the 1990s, so until about 30 years ago, was to uh, was a simple mastectomy. And and the goal, I think the overall, I think this is important for patients. The overall goal of why we treat DCIS is it's to prevent progression for to invasive breast cancer. Um, a, uh, a surgery is generally considered curative. Uh, generally, the risk of local recurrence after a mastectomy is about two, two and a half percent. Um, now, we generally do a mastectomy, um, and I think Dr. Ahn had gone over this, for patients who have DCIS in multiple places in their breast. Um, one of the other things we do is we oftentimes will check the lymph nodes um, underneath the arm. Um, and this is in the event that we do find some invasion when we do the surgery because we cannot go back and do a sentinel node biopsy um, without an intact breast. Next slide. What we do more commonly these days is breast conservation therapy for DCIS, and that is a combination of um, lumpectomy uh, and uh, radiation therapy. Uh, there have been four, there have been four large trials that um, looked at this and found that it was very effective, a very effective treatment for DCIS. Next slide. Um, again, just to stress again uh, that the DCIS um, with treatment has an excellent prognosis. You can see here um, uh, there's no Overall, you see that the prognosis is outstanding for breast cancer's specific survival, but I think it's also important to note that there's no difference um, between um, lumpectomy uh, and mastectomy uh, in terms of their outcome. Next trial, next, next slide. So one of the other treatments that we oftentimes offer for patients who have DCIS is in addition to surgery and radiation, we oftentimes also discuss adjuvant endocrine therapy. And, and these are for patients who have estrogen receptor positive DCIS. Um, in general, um, when you there's two medications that you can give. You can give tamoxifen for premenopausal women. Uh, and that in general, where we have an additional benefit of over radiation, of an additional 30% benefit of reducing the risk of recurrence. Um, and then aromatase inhibitors, which we generally give to postmenopausal women, have a little bit of an additional benefit over the tamoxifen. Um, however, again, 
um, we should note that um, neither the radiation or the um, endocrine therapy has an impact on survival. It's just really basically a reduction in local recurrence. Next slide. So one of the big sort of uh, areas of study right now in DCIS is trying to get an understanding of like all the different types of DCIS. So, you know, there's a concern that we are actually over treating some women um, who have DCIS because their DCIS is not necessarily going to progress to invasive breast cancer. So again, this touches a little bit on what Dr. al -Zubedi was talking about, about the heterogeneity, uh, how there's many different types of breast cancer. Um, so the same is likely true for DCIS. There's probably many different types of DCIS. But in the with DCIS, one of the biggest challenges is challenges for, for physicians is that we don't really know how to tell them apart. We're still trying to learn that. So our biggest challenge is, challenge is predicting which patients with DCIS will progress to invasive breast cancer and which patients will not. So the factors that, some of the important factors that are, that, uh, um, that are related to the risk of recurrence are age um, and tumor size and, and, are among the, and then also uh, grade. So, um, so just to give you an example, um, you know, some patients who have low-grade DCIS um, and who are um, young, who are, excuse me, who are, um, oh, I think, who are uh, older um, and have a smaller tumor, they tend to have a, um, so they're, they're older, smaller tumor, they have a lower risk of recurrence. Uh, compared to patients who may be younger, larger tumor, um, they tend to have a higher risk of recurrence. It's just kind of an example of how there might be at least two groups of DCIS. Next slide. So I think one of the questions we're starting to ask ourselves as, um, as, as uh, surgeons and uh, uh, oncologists is, can we really tell apart those patients? Is there a way that we can tell apart patients who may who maybe we can do a little less treatment for because because giving them surgery radiation and endocrine therapy potentially is too much maybe maybe some patients need um a little bit less um so one way that we was one way that was that we tried to look at this is by separating patients um based on tumor size and grade and so you can see here um cohort one which is the um yellow line um, and cohort two, which is the blue line, which is the high-grade tumors, um, those high-grade tumors, um, we can tell that those patients um, that had higher-risk tumors had a higher risk of recurrence compared to patients with um, lower-risk tumors. Next slide. Um, another way uh, to, that we can potentially try to stratify DCIS is, um, is Oncotype DX for DCIS. So this is actually based off of what Dr. al -Zubedi talked about for Oncotype DX for invasive cancer. There's on Oncotype DX for DCIS. And so they took a subset of the same genes that they looked at for cancer, and they used these subset to look at um, risk of recurrence for DCIS. And um, they stratified them uh, into low, intermediate, and high risk scores. And they also, in addition to looking at um, the gene expression, they also incorporated size and age. And they were able to stratify patients, um, again, this way. So for example, if you look at, the, in the first row, we have women who are um, grade, older than 50, um, who have a low risk score and they have a small tumor, they have the lowest risk of occurrence at 7.2%. And then if you look at the last column, a high, someone who has a high, DCI, high, high DCIS score with Oncotype DX for DCIS and who's younger and has a larger tumor has a much higher risk of recurrence. So this is a useful test, um, but sometimes it's it can be a useful test but it, it doesn't, it, because the patient population that this was studied in, it was a group of patients that didn't have radiation, uh, we don't, it is not as useful 
um, in terms of predicting um, predicting uh, the benefit from radiation versus no radiation. Next slide. So um, another way that we are looking at um, trying to, to put to, to categorize patients with DCIS is looking at um, their molecular subtype. Um, and again, this is similar to what Dr. Al Zubaidi talked about with uh, invasive cancer. Next slide. Um, and more recently, uh, we are talking about one of the uh, newer ways that we're trying to, to stratify or categorize DCIS is by using protein biomarkers. And, um, and so there's a newer test, um, next slide, uh, it's called Decision RT, and actually this should be DCIS Decision RT, I think this was an autocorrect. Um, but this is a test that takes, that measures um, a number of proteins, which are here on the right side, and also incorporates the presence of a mass, age, and tumor size, and comes up with a risk score. Um, and a low risk tumor has a score less than three, and a high risk tumor is greater than three. And one of the nice things about this test is that it gives you the risk of recurrence with and without radiation. So, um, so in this particular example, this is a high risk patient and without radiation, um, their risk of recurrence is 20% for invasive risk uh, and 28% for DCIS risk. And then with radiation, the risk is significantly decreased. You can see 7% and 9% indicating that radiation in this particular patient had a significant benefit. Next slide. Um, so, so more recently, um, in addition to trying to de-escalate care in terms of the treatments that we know about, surgery, radiation, and endocrine therapy, some investigators have been wondering whether or not everybody needs surgery. And so to sort of get at this, or to start to get at this question, um, a group of investigators um, look to see what happens if you don't treat, treat DCIS. And they found that um, there was actually no difference in patients who had low-grade DCIS um, that turned out their disease-specific um, survival. There was no surgery, it was 90, patients who had surgery was 98.6%, and patients who had no surgery was 98.8%. So there's really no difference uh, between those that were treated and those that were not treated in terms of their uh, disease-specific um, survival. Next, next slide. Um, so this led to a bunch of active surveillance um, trials in that throughout the world. And I'm just going to focus on the trial in the United States. It's called the COMET trial. Uh, and it's for grade one and two, grade DCIS that's grade one and two. Uh, and what they're doing is they are um, ra randomizing patients to standard care versus active surveillance. Uh, next slide. This is just a schema of that trial um, where they are, again, comparing patients to have guideline concordant care, surgery, radiation, and endocrine therapy versus active surveillance with imaging. And they're following these patients for five years. Um, and then their endpoints are, are they're looking at invasive, the risk of invasive cancer. Two, at two years, they're looking at how many patients had invasive cancer. Uh, and then another thing that I think is important um, because patients are getting so much imaging is they are um, looking at uh, patient reported outcomes to see how patients feel about being watched over having surgery. Um, next slide. So I'm just going to wrap up very quickly because I know there's a lot of questions. I want to spend like two minutes talking about a clinical trial that I have ongoing, uh, and it's in DCIS patients. Uh, we call it the PROMISE study, which is the prevention of menopause symptom, menopausal symptoms and breast cancer invasion. Next slide. So you can slip this, skip this slide because I know we're short on time, uh, and you can skip this one too. Um, so um, basically, we're studying a, a novel drug uh, that's actually FDA approved um, for menopausal symptoms. Um, it's called DUAV, and it's a combination of um, Premarin, which most of you know about, and also um, uh, Basidoxaphine, which is actually a third generation. It's a it's a relative of tamoxifen. It's a more advanced version of tamoxifen. Uh, you can you can uh, skip it to the next slide. 
Um, one of the things that I want to stress is a lot of people think that estrogen is actually um, actually estrogen can actually cause breast cancer, but in but what we do know is there was a large um, trial that was called the Women's Health um, Initiative, where um, they studied women who got conjugated estrogens or Premarin, and they followed them for uh, about 12 years. Uh, and they found that actually in these women, um, the breast cancer incidence uh, decreased in women who took estrogen, and as did breast cancer mortality. So these again are women who had undergone a hysterectomy and were taking just estrogen. And this is in contrast to women who take the combination of estrogen and progesterone, um, which um, which we which is the, which can actually increase your risk of breast cancer. Next slide. Um, this is just a, a graph that illustrates that breast cancer um, decreases. Uh, so this graph shows that um, the red line is the incidence of breast cancer um, when you take estrogen and progesterone, and the blue line is the uh, is estrogen alone, and then there are two dotted lines in the middle, which is placebo. Next try, next uh, next slide. You can skip this one. I'll just go to the. Uh, um, you can skip that one too. Uh, keep going. <laughs> you can skip this try. Skip that one as well. I just briefly want to show you the schema. Um, Sorry, it's uh, not navigating forward just yet. It might have. Oh. Well, I'll just keep talking because I don't want to. I know we have to. Uh, oh, there we go. So we'll just stop here and I'll. Oh, sorry. Um, we'll just. I just want to talk about this really briefly. So we're recruiting postmenopausal women with DCIS, um, and we are randomizing them to take um, the DUAV, which is a combination of the Premarin and Benzodiazepine. And or placebo, and they take this medication for um, for 28 days approximately, and then they undergo surgery. And then what we're doing is measuring a bunch of biomarkers, and we're comparing these protein markers and uh, gene expression profiling before surgery, so from their from their biopsy, uh, and and from their tissue from their sur surgical specimen. And our overall goal, next slide, is to potentially actually have a, a, treat, a medication that can potentially be a treatment for DCIS and prevent progression to invasive breast cancer. And it, another sort of thing that we're thinking about with this medication is to help women who are breast cancer survivors who have menopausal symptoms to give them an opportunity to take something that will not increase their risk of developing breast cancer and help with their symptoms. And I'll stop there. Thank you.